All right. So when you first get to to the canvas shell, should look like this. A little test too. Um, I, this is also the way that I usually do any communicating if I have to by posting files late or letting you know that I posted the key to a homework assignment, um, that kind of thing. I usually just send it out as an announcement through Canvas, uh, which are set to show up at the top. There's none there, but underneath recent announcements, when I start making announcements, that's where they'll show up, the most, three most recent. Um, and then if you scroll down, um, this is, I kind of have it set up chronologically here. Um, I go back and forth about whether it would be better to have it like grouped by subject or chapter or chronologically. Um, but I, I always kind of settle on chronologically and I'll change that color here, usually on Monday. Um, whenever I remember to go in, I have to mess with the HTML code to change the color of the buttons. For whatever week we're in is gonna be red. Um, the weeks after that are still published. And I think you probably still have access to them, but they're gonna have last quarter's material and stuff like that. So it's not really as relevant to you. So don't don't really try to read ahead too much. Go with the stay with the week we're on. So if you were looking for the recordings, click on week one. Um, this had a link to a resources page, which also had the equation sheet, which we'll talk about in more detail in a second. Um, as well as I, I try to remember any new assignments. I'll put the links in here. So the quizzes, the past review. Here's where I post the slides as PDFs. Um, and then when I have the videos posted, I'll also put a link here that just goes to a YouTube uh, playlist. Um, so it'll be you know, not great quality, but I try to capture most of the board work at least. And so if you're not here, that's better than nothing. It's not as good as being here and being able to take notes and see the slides and the board at the same time. But with the classroom set up here, this has worked all right. I'll open to suggestions if you have any ideas for improving it, though. Um, let me know if you have any any ideas. Um, you can also get to the rest of my classes lectures from here. I don't know why you'd want to do that, but if you wanted to go watch my OCHEM lectures or something like that from the college, they're all there and freely available um, if you want to do that. Uh, the other really useful tool on Canvas that I would highly recommend paying attention to is your to-do list, your checklist over on the side. Just because anything that has a due date, any assignment that has a due date is going to you haven't turned in yet, is going to show up over there. Um, so if you aren't sure if you have any new assignments to work on, look over there. If you've done everything over in the to-do list, then you don't necessarily have anything else you need to be working on. Um, it's, um, so don't, don't fret too much the assignments. I don't really use the modules, but I can't turn them off. I just use these these week overviews. Um, so you can go through the modules, but they kind of are messy. And because I tried using them and it didn't really work for the way that I teach for my students. Um, so if you try to go through the modules, you might confuse yourself. But if you get lost on Canvas or just need more help working through finding anything, just let me know. And I'll show you where it is. I'll screenshot it and send you a picture. Um, and then the other place, the um, resource and study tools. So make sure this is the right version. But basically the equation sheet and the conversion sheet that will be on both of your quizzes or quizzes tests um, is already available here. So like I said, you can get used to using this. Um, I ran out of time to print out everybody off copies, but I'll do that for, for Wednesday. Um, or you can print one off at home, but it's just got, you know, good, good conversions. We'll talk about how the unit prefixes work today. Um, but then it's also got common constants, geometry equations. Um, and then there's also a, uh, periodic table. This will be the same version of the periodic table that will be on your test as well. So again, good one to practice using so that on the test, you're not, oh shoot, I was using my own periodic table that had the values listed differently and now I'm confused. We want to avoid that. So get used to using the tools that you'll have on the test 
so that when you get to the test, you don't panic. It's, it seems seems silly, but it's a pretty useful uh, tool. I do have some other, other periodic tables on here. If you want a color version of the same periodic table from the um, that will be on the test, you can have one. There's one here. There's some other versions of it as well. Um, and then you know a lot of stuff that we haven't gone over yet that we'll see that uh, will make more sense as we get to that. All right. So questions on Canvas. Questions about due dates. Like I said, I got through about the first third of your quizzes. And so we'll talk about some of those questions um, as the, that pertain to the, to the class. Um, let me just pull up the Dropbox so I can get the slides going. Uh, I do remember somebody asked a question about due dates. The due dates will typically, I'll typically give you at least a week to work on an assignment. So even the labs, like this week, you'll do your first lab and it's basically just going to be practice measuring stuff and talking about uncertainty. Um, you'll do the test or the lab on Thursday and then turn it in the following Thursday. Um, for specific short assignments, there might be um, some assignments where I want, I want a faster turnaround um, for whatever reason, if it's a really fast assignment or I want to make sure you get it done before the weekend so that we can take a quiz on Monday or something like that. Um, there might be some some variation there, but in general, you get a week to work on any assignment from the day that you start the assignment to the day that it's due. Do we talk about late work? Um, I do accept late work. Canvas just gives it puts a timestamp on it so I'll know how late it is. Um, if it's late for a good reason, and you can turn it in on Canvas, so you're not being here. It's not really a great reason. Um, but if you miss the day we did the lab because you were at a ski race or something like that, um, and you're going to make it up the following week, talk to me, and and we can work on on um, an extension for that. But in general, I take off about one one point for every class period. It's late out of out of ten, which I usually cap at about five five out of 10. Um, so even I don't want to get 25 assignments from you on the finals week. Um, but the, up till finals week, I will accept late work. It'll just only be worth that half credit at most. Um, so try to turn stuff in on time. But if you don't, for whatever reason, um, don't just leave it empty because five out of 10 is better than zero out of 10, right? So some people have some random questions too. Um, what's the difference between organic chemistry and inorganic chemistry? Does anybody know that one? What is organic chemistry? It doesn't mean non-synthetic, like it does in food. Organic in chemistry just means carbon-based. Um, it just means that it's primarily the chemistry of carbon. Because up until the late 1800s, it was thought that only living organisms were capable of making what they called organic molecules. Um, and it wasn't until uh, a guy who was doing some research on inorganic chemistry accidentally made an organic molecule um, that they realized that you can make organic molecules in a lab without living organisms um, if, you, if you do it properly. And so, but the name was already established. They already had decided that it was organic chemistry. So it's still organic chemistry, even though it has nothing to do with living organisms anymore. Um, we're not exclusive to living organisms. Uh, or OCHEM also has a reputation as being a really hard sort of gatekeeping weed out class in, especially for pre-meds or people that are going into biology fields because most bio degrees and all pre-med programs require you to take usually at least one semester, usually two semesters of organic chemistry. Um, and 
it doesn't need to be as hard as it's made out to be, but you do have to think about it differently. General chemistry, which is what this is, is going to feel more like a bunch of random topics kind of thrown together. Organic chemistry is one topic that you study in depth for the entire year or your entire career if you're an organic chemist. Um, basically, every chapter that we go over in this class is its own upper division course, semester long course, if you're a chemistry major. Um, so this course is going to be feel like we're switching gears all the time, um, whereas the the second and third and fourth year chemistry classes are a lot more like, OK, you understand that that let's dig into it more. OK, let's figure out what the exceptions are to that rule we learned last week and why. And you just get to keep going deeper and deeper and deeper, which is to me a lot more satisfying in a lot of ways, but um, it's not what pre-meds, I'll, I'll generalize um, and say that pre-meds in particular struggle with organic chemistry because you can't just memorize your way through it. Um, which if you're used to doing well in, in high school classes and in first year chemistry or first year college classes, you basically can just memorize stuff to get A's without necessarily thinking about it in more depth. OCHEM, you can't really do that. And so that's why it has a reputation of being really, really hard. It's not hard, it's different than what you're used to. Um, that said, it's my favorite branch of, of chemistry. It's what I studied in grad school. Uh, it's kind of my, my go-to, it's my favorite class to teach. Um, do I like cheese? Who doesn't like cheese? Are there, is there, do people exist that don't like cheese? If so, don't tell me because I'm not gonna be able to compartmentalize that when I'm grading your papers. Um, I like I like a lot of cheese. Typically though, my favorite, um, if it's you know 10 o'clock at night and I'm hungry and I wanna have some like triscuits and cheese, it's usually gonna be like a soft goat cheese. I love goat cheese. Um, but that said, I don't have a kind of cheese I don't like. So I love blue cheese, especially on pizza. I love blue cheese on pizza. Especially blue cheese dressing. And then somebody else asked me, what are my answers to the quiz questions? What are my, what's my music? So I put a bunch of music, music examples of stuff I've been listening to lately. Um, a lot of a lot of doom metal, which if you don't know what that is, it's not black metal or death metal. Doom metal is like, is Black Sabbath's first song on their first LP, which, you know, it's Black Sabbath by Black Sabbath on the album Black Sabbath. That's doom metal. Um, and it's kind of spun into its own. It's kind of like slow grunge. Think of grunge, just really, really slow and heavy. Um, that's kind of what, what doom metal is. Um, and speaking of grunge, if, you, if you've never understood why Neil Young is called the godfather of grunge, because you know him mostly as doing like acoustic folk rock stuff, um, you need to listen to Into the Black by Neil Young. That link in particular, it's a really, really good live version from the 70s. Um, but yeah, he absolutely invented grunge. He just didn't call it grunge because it was 1979 and they didn't know what grunge was. Um, I like a lot of other stuff too. All, anything country that's not on the radio, I probably like at least a little bit. I like hip hop too. Run the Jewels are my favorite right now, but kind of all over the place with that one. Um, movies and books, mostly sci-fi like you might expect. I'm a big nerd. Um, so if it's sci-fi where the science part's done well, I probably liked it. But then I like a lot of other stuff too. Cormac McCarthy is one of my favorites. Um, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, and uh, there's some, I like a lot of uh, good comic books too, Day Tripper by Fabio Moon and Gabriel Bach is really, really good, and N.K. Jemisin's like fantasy, sci-fi-ish kind of weirdness, um, N.K. Jemisin is really, really good too, fantasy is more your jam, make sure you check her out. Anyway. Um, Random stuff that's actually more relevant to class. When we're preparing for exams, are there practice sheets? Yeah, I'll give you last year's test. I'll give you last year's or last quarter's exam for the midterm. And your, your homework assignment that week will just be 
practice taking those that test. I'll give you the key to it and everything, um, but I don't change the format at all between um, between the practice test and the actual in class test. Um, and I'll even show you what that looks like right now. So I just give you a practice test. Answer these questions. Here's some practice naming stuff. Here's some practice uh, with some of the conceptual things we did. And then the final will literally be the exact same questions with just different reactions, different numbers, um, different specific examples. You know, number six is going to be a pH question. It's just going to be a matter of is it calcium hydroxide and hydrogen iodide, or is it something else? It will, it, I'll tell you, it will be something else, um, but in different numbers, but it'll be the same type of question. So these are gonna be your best tools for studying because you can practice, um, this is the exact type of question. And then there's usually number 10. So it's, it's gonna be 10, 10 point questions. Um, so you know exactly how much everything's worth. Usually number 10 is gonna be a bit of a wild card. I'll have you do a little bit of problem solving That'll be the one place where I might throw a curveball at you um, and make you think on your feet. But that's only 10 points out of 100, right? And my class averages on the test are usually right around 80. Um, so you can get above the class average without even touching number 10, usually. If you know, if you practice one through nine and you get those down really well. Um, so that's to sort of take away some of the pressure of having to think on your feet, because I know that that's really tricky in a stressful environment. Stressful and, you know, time pressure environments are not conducive to creative thinking and problem solving necessarily. Um, so it's kind of really to separate the people who get A's on the test from the people who will get B's on the test, which will be most people, but they will be, that's sort of the goal of 10. It's not, it's supposed to be a stretch question. But anyway, more on that when we get closer. I just wanted to show you what that looked like. I talked about due dates already. Um, what part of this class will be the most difficult and require the most attention? Just staying on top of the assignments. If you show up and you turn in stuff at least close to the due date, within a few days of the due date at least, um, you should be able to do pretty well in this class. Show up, take notes do the quizzes, do the assignments on time, and you should be fine. That said, there are kind of a lot of assignments and I get that. So that's probably gonna be the single hardest part of this class is just staying on top of it, not letting it get away from you. Um, if you're anything like me, then as soon as I let that something start to get away from me, if I have two overdue do, um, assignments, that starts looking really, really insurmountable to me. And then rather than try and tackle one of them, I'll just not do anything. And now I'm four assignments behind. Um, that's, you know, that happens to everybody. If it happens to you all the time, it may be a sign of ADHD, like it was for me. Um, but I'm not going to diagnose anybody. I'm just saying that's a pretty normal feeling to have, to want to procrastinate because you started getting behind. But if it's taking over your life because you can't do help but do that, you might want to talk to, to, uh, somebody about that. Um, or maybe that's just me projecting onto my students. All right, let's practice. Let's go back to some new material, not new material. This is kind of where we left off. I switched up the practice problem. It was 5 million inches into miles, right? Um, if we wanted to go 5.33 miles to centimeters, how would we do that? So remember, set up, we're gonna try and multiply by one consecutively, right? We're gonna set up our conversion factors so that we can cancel out miles. So, and then we're gonna try and cancel out whatever we're left with after miles to get, we're just gonna try and get closer and closer to centimeters. All right, and if you don't know where to start, start by li making a list of things like, okay, well, I know I can convert miles into feet. I know I have a conversion for that, right? 
So this is what I'd call a, a roadmap. I know I can do miles to feet. And I'm trying to get to centimeters over here. Well, that means I've got to switch from imperial units to metric units, right? So what conversion am I going to have to use to get from imperial units to metric units? Centimeters and inches, right? So I know I have to do that step. Well, now I can connect both ends here, right? You can kind of start at the at both extremes of this problem, of these problems, and work your way to the middle to figure out what your overall plan is going to be, what your, your roadmap is going to be. I know I can do miles to feet. I know I can do feet to inches. I know I can do inches to centimeters. I have all those conversions, right? And once you have, have an idea of what the conversions are, and then you can start actually filling in the numbers and writing it out, showing your work. Who has their conversions memorized? You had all weekend. How come you don't have them memorized yet? One mile is 5,280. Good. Now you can stop, hit enter on your calculator right here, write down the number, write down your answer in feet, and then take that answer in feet and convert it to inches. Um, I, Since there's nothing that stops us from doing all of this in one step though, logically, mathematically, it's not against the rules to just keep converting, right? So I'm, I typically just set it up in one step. If I'm going to stop in the middle of a long conversion, it's basically because I ran out of room. If I got to the end of my page of paper and I want, I'll stop, hit enter on my calculator and then start on the next line. Um, either that or sometimes if I get to the end of a piece of paper, I'll just do one of these and continue the conversion on the next line. Just use that arrow to say I just kept going. Feet, one foot, 12 inches. Want feet to cancel out feet. So miles is going to cancel miles, feet to cancel out feet. And then inches to centimeters. One inch is 2.54 centimeters. And then inches cancels into inches. Only unit left is centimeters. So we're just gonna take our 5.33 times 5,280 times 12 times 2.54. What do we get for an answer? Say it louder. How many sig figs do we get to keep? Three. There's looks like there's only two sig figs there, but remember this is an exact conversion, right? So it's really infinite sig figs. It's not about 12 inches in a foot, it's exactly 12 inches in a foot. Which means 5.33 has the fewest number of sig figs. Everything else was exact. Uh, if I was, if we were going to not use exact conversions, is there another road, is there another pathway we could use to get from miles to centimeters? Uh, spoiler alert, there is. Can anybody think of what it might be? Mile, and how would you get from miles to meters? It is, but on a conversion sheet, it's miles to kilometers first. So on the in the way that I do that on the test is I say, show me, show me all the conversions. You're absolutely right. That's the right conversion to get there. But the way we'd show our work would go miles to kilometers, kilometers to meters, meters to centimeters. 
So in that case, still four steps, there's still three conversions, right? Five point three three miles, one mile, and this again is from the conversion sheet one point six oh nine kilometers. Then, how do you know how many kilometers are in, or how many meters are in a kilometer, or how many kilometers are in a meter? One thousand. Which way, 1,000 kilometers in a meter or 1,000 meters in a kilometer? 1,000 meters in a kilometer. So one kilometer, we'll talk about those prefixes and get some practice with that today. It's easy enough when it's meters and kilometers because you know what a meter is and you know that the kilometer is big, right? It's a little bit harder when you're using prefixes you're less familiar with. And then last but not least, centimeters, meters to centimeters. How do I set that one up? This is, this seems really obvious. You all know what a centimeter looks like. You know what a meter looks like, right? You know that there's more centimeters in a meter. Um, however, especially on the test in timed high pressure situations, it's really easy to mix these up. Again, especially with units you're less familiar with. I won't tell you how many times I've had to correct people that said that there's a thousand kilograms in a gram. Right, it's really easy. You know, it's kilos a thousand, right? You still have to think about it and make sure you set it up the right way. Thousand meters is one kilometer, not a thousand kilometers is one meter. Stop every time you write one of these down. And actually, people mess up this one all the time too. People say two point five four inches is one centimeter instead of the other way around. It's easy to do when you're going fast, right? So pay attention, make sure when you write down your conversion factors, you did get the numbers right, okay? So we'll get, what's, how many, I guess it'll be the same number, right? 8.58, or is it off by a sig fig? After you round, right? So this was a, not an exact conversion. This is approximate, which means if we want, if we had more than four sig figs in our initial measurement, we wouldn't want to use this conversion. Or if we did, we would have to remember this is approximate. We'd have to round up four sig figs, even if our starting number was five sig figs. Because if you use an approximate conversion, now that factors into our rules for how many sig figs we get to keep at the end. This version, it doesn't. No matter how many sig figs we start with, we get to keep all of them, right? Because all of these ones in the top row were exact conversions. As soon as you use an approximate conversion, that messes, messes up your sig fig rules a little bit. You just have to be careful. As long as you don't need more than four sig figs though, we'll get the same answer after we round anyway. Could you explain the difference between approximate and exact again for everybody? Yeah, so remember, exact means is our, the way we're going to define that is if it's a conversion between units in the same system, like inches to feet, that's an exact conversion. That's the definition of a foot is 12 inches. It's exactly, it's 12.00 out to infinity, infinite number of sig figs. If it's an approximate conversion, or that's the other way of saying that we don't, it's, it's a measured number, meaning that this has four sig figs, not infinite sig figs. This one's still exact because it's 
meters to kilometers. That's conversion between units in the same system, right? Metric to metric is going to be exact. Metric to metric is exact. Imperial to imperial, imperial to imperial, those are both exact. So infinite sig figs. And this is our one exact, so I guess not our one exact, there is the 40 degrees example when we're talking about Fahrenheit. But other than temperature, this is our one conversion between metric and imperial units that is exact with infinite sig figs. Everything else that goes between metric and imperial is going to be measured, is going to be an approximate conversion. And we go back to the conversion sheet real quick. Um, that practice test also will have the, the um, same conversion sheet on it as well. Um, for the most part, if it's going between systems or if it's not clear, like there's a weird unit we use in chemistry called an angstrom, which is a tenth of a nanometer. That's an exact conversion. Um, and so most of them are going to be approximate if they're between systems and exact if they're within the same system. And so that's called out specifically on the conversion sheet. So you don't even have to remember. You just have to remember what that means if you get used to using the conversion sheet. Here's another example. One liter is 10 to the three cubic centimeters. Exact, a liter is metric, cubic centimeters is metric. One liter is 1.0567 quarts. That's between imperial and metric. That's approximate, okay? <clears throat> All right. Questions on, on these multi-step conversions. Easy enough when we're doing something like going from one length to a different length. When we start doing things like going from a length to a time, that gets a little bit weirder, but we'll do some practice with those. That's really where conversions are really, really useful um, in a way that it's not entirely obvious at first, but we'll get there. All right, so how these, that centimeters, 100 centimeters is one meter, 1,000 meters is one kilometer. You know that probably because you've been exposed to it at some point in the past, right? Um, how do we know that, that if you go back to the conversion sheet, that's not specifically called out. There are not actually, it's not actually a length conversion over here between centimeters and meters. But there is this section down here that talks about unit prefixes. Turns out centi and kilo and um, micro and milli and all the rest of the ones in that middle section there. We can actually apply those prefixes to any unit that we want. So basically this box, this table here, is a huge list of conversions because you can have you can have a kilo mile if you wanted. A kilo mile would just be a thousand miles. Right. And so the so with that in mind, why would we why would we bother? Why do we care? Why not just do everything in miles and meters? Why do we have kilometers or centimeters in the first place? Because they're better? It is definitely easier to go from, from um, to miles to milli miles than it is to go from miles to feet. Right? You can do that math in your head if it's all even powers of 10. But why bother in the first place? Why not just do everything in terms of miles? Does it really matter mathematically if it's one, 1. 1.25 
miles or um, 1,250 miles or millimiles. Why would we bother using a prefix? Why do you measure something in feet instead of miles if you're just in everyday life? If I asked you how big this classroom was, what's the distance between this wall and that wall? How would you estimate it? In feet, why? That's how we were taught. How we were taught? A prettier number? That's that's sounds like that's a subjective statement. That seems like something we shouldn't use in science classes, but it's absolutely right. Yeah, you know, our brains don't work well if you get away from anything between about 0.1 to 10. Our brains are capable of processing what a number is if it's between about a tenth and 10. If I say what's a hundred feet, or if I said, oh, you know, how big is a hundred yards? What does your brain do? It puts it in football fields, right? Because one football field is something your brain can wrap, can understand, but a hundred feet isn't, or a hundred yards isn't, which is weird. It's just a sort of a, a artifact of the way we evolve, the way that our neurology works. Our brains don't process numbers very well once you get farther away from more than 10. And really, I'll really mess with your minds here. You actually can't count visually um, for a num for a group that is more than three objects. If you try to count visually, just looking at something and knowing how many objects there are, if it's more than three objects, your brain instinctively breaks it up into groups of twos and threes and then adds them together. So if I'm looking at this front table right here, I can look at it and see three students. If I look and try to count students over here, I see two and two. Our brains don't process beyond three and really about a third. We can get by okay between 0.1 and 10, but really we want our numbers to be between about a third and three, just because of the way that our brains process information. So now for the rest of your life, when you count objects, you're going to notice that you do that. You're going to say, oh, that was two and three to make five. And you can try and prove me wrong. But if you're being honest with yourself, you'll look at it and say, oh, that was two and two, or that's one and one and three. It's just, it's weird, but that's the way it works. So with that in mind, that's why we have these prefixes. Because we don't really want units where we have numbers more than 100 or less than 0.1. So we try to, and especially, we try to be under a thousand. Um, again, you can't really visualize what 580 looks like, but we can kind of break that up and like, oh, it's about half of a thousand, right? And so that starts putting it into something that your brain can comprehend a little bit. Um, so that's why we, we use these prefixes in general. That's why we don't count our road trips in terms of feet. I'm going on a road trip from here to Seattle. I'm not going to measure it in feet, right? Really, I'm going to actually break it up more than just in miles because I don't even want to think about it in terms of a thousand miles. I'm going to think about it in terms of how many hours it was, is, right? Or how many days it's going to take because we can comprehend that better. Um, Also, this is just, this is a bit of an aside, but there's a fun link here. I forgot it has sound. Um, that looks at this, it's called the scale of the universe, where it just has um, the approx a bunch of, of random objects. Um, and you can basically just use the scroll bar to zoom in, say, okay, matchstick, square inch. There's a square inch, a penny. You can just keep going. And every one of these circles is going to be another factor of 10. So this is stuff that's about the size of a millimeter. You can get to stuff. There's a micrometer. We started getting things like viruses. But you can also go the other way. Sleep. 
basketballs. Just know that there's giant earthworms that are about 10 feet long. Um, and if you really want some nightmare fuel, there's, where are they? There it is. Japanese spider crabs have a wingspan. They look like spiders, but they have a wingspan of about 10 feet, um, which if you don't like spiders like me, like I could just you know, stay away from Japan for the rest of my life. I'd love to visit, but I'm not gonna go anywhere near those. Um, but you can keep zooming out. There's a lot of fun trivia stuff in here too. Like this is actually helpful for us for comparing comparing things because how many of you have been to Yosemite and seen half, half Dome in person? Half Dome is roughly the same size as the Washington Monument, which is kind of cool to think about. Never see them next to each other unless it's in a situation like this. And then we start getting into dwarf planets. Rhode Island. <laughs> Rhode Island is bigger than a dwarf planet. Some dwarf planets. Italy and California, about the same size. Interestingly enough, right? You need some more shape. Moons, Earth, small stars. Sirius B is a white dwarf. It's barely bigger than the Earth. A Minecraft world. Minecraft world is 64,000 kilometers on the, um, on the end. And then we start getting into just stars, and then we get into the Kuiper Belt. Who knows what the Kuiper Belt is? So that's what we just call the asteroid belt. The one that's on the outside of the solar system that Pluto is a part of is called the Kuiper Belt. So, just kind of a fun way to kill some time, learn some things, and then you get into, you go all the way out, a yacht a meter, the Sloan Great Wall is a, is a barrier, a natural barrier in the universe that's um, where, where we stop seeing galaxies that are further away than, than the Sloan Great Wall, which is about a gigaparsec per birth. And then you get to the observable universe. If you go the other way, if you get motion sick, close your eyes. Notice there's not a whole lot going on down here, right? You get smaller than your DNA. In individual molecules, there's not very much. There's a neutrino, is one yoctometer. <laughs> but if you keep going, we get to what's called the Planck the plank plate. The plank, plank plate is basically the pixelation of the universe. Things don't exist smaller than a Planck length. Um, there's also a Planck unit of time as well. So there actually is, time is not continuous. It is discrete and so is matter. It's just, you have to get down to 10 to the minus 35 meters. So a zero, a decimal point, 34 zeros, and then a one is about a Planck length. Don't say Planck though. I had in grad school, my, my physical organic professor was from, was from Poland. Um, like Max Planck, and he threatened to fail us if we said Planck. Um, he was very particular about the way you pronounce Eastern European last names. Um, I don't think he actually would have failed us, but none of us really wanted to test him because he was the type that might. So, Planck length. Planck length. Planck length. Planck length. All right, so all that just to say, we don't really want to use that. What's happening here? There. We don't really want to use the same unit of length for everything, but we also want a really easy way to break it up into smaller or bigger units. And that's why we use these metric. They're not really metric prefixes. They're called SI prefixes. 
Um, where it is. Yeah. Slide didn't get updated. I'll exit out of this again so I can pull up the prefixes the way it's shown on the practice. So these, what's different about these versus the prefixes that, and really you can think about miles and feet and inches as being serving a similar purpose, right? Those were just like fractional scales though. 12 inches was useful because an inch is about the distance between your thumb knuckle to the tip of your thumb or the width of your thumb, depending on your hand. And a foot is literally close to an adult male's foot. Um, and a mile, I don't remember the official definition of why they picked a mile. I talked about where acres came from, right? But a lot of the, the imperial units just had derivations that came from things you could see visually. So it made it so you didn't need a ruler, you could just look at your thumb, say, okay, count how many, if I needed to figure that out, right? Um, you didn't need to have, have a ruler. But we can do better than that now. So we'll stick to using these SI unit prefixes. And like I said, they're not specific to the metric system. You can put them on anything. You can have nano pounds. You can have giga inches. The trick is remembering whether it's a prefix that makes something smaller or larger. So the way that I approach this table, if I was a student, is I, I would basically, like, look, if you look at these, what it says multipliers, the bottom column here, or the bottom row, everything to the right of deci has, a, has 10 to a positive number. And I know that a kilo means that there's, that it's larger than something else, right? Kilo means a thousand. So that means that all of these prefixes over here, when I'm writing them out and trying to make sure I don't mix up whether 10 to the third goes on top or bottom, think about whether you're making the unit larger or smaller. Is a kilogram larger than a gram? If so, then that tells you, okay, well, I know the multiplier is 10 to the three, but I don't remember is that 10 to the three kilograms equals one gram, or is it 10 to the three grams equals one kilogram? Well, again, this is one kilo we have a fair bit of experience with, right? So this one's pretty obvious to see, but use that as, a, as an example. So, okay, well, I don't remember Terra, but I know that it's just like kilo, but bigger. So 10 to the 12 of something is one Terra of that thing. What's something in everyday life that has tera as a prefix? Terabytes. A terabyte is 10 to the 12th bytes. Does anybody know what a byte is? It's a unit of memory. It's a unit of information. Um, does anybody know where that comes from? Does anybody know what a bit is? A bit is the smallest unit of information that you can have. A bit is a one or a zero, an on or an off. In a, originally, one of the, the earliest computers, you basically had eight dots to represent any character. And a one in the right spot made that spot light up and a zero left it dark. And so you could use eight bits to represent one character, uh, to represent an A or a B or a C. And the way that you, and it's not, they weren't exactly oriented like this, but basically it took eight bits to represent one character of information, one letter of information. And so that's actually what a byte is, is one character of information, an A or B or C or a one or a five or a six. So a terabyte is enough information. It's 10 to the 12 characters of information, 10 to the 12 letters of information, which I think is pretty close to the combined information stored in Wikipedia. It's somewhere right. Maybe that's a peta. Maybe that might be a petabyte. 
Um, but basically the sum of the humanity's knowledge is about a, a terabyte or a petabyte, one of the two, I don't remember which. Anyway, um, so how do we use these? Well, we just use them to make sure we don't have huge numbers or really, really small numbers. Back to this idea that we don't think well between outside of between 0.1 and, and 100 is also the reason why we use scientific notation because we can't really process what what a trillion looks like even just visualizing on writing one trillion on a piece of paper is hard to kind of visualize what that represents but if you write one times 10 to the 12th your brain can process oh 12 zeros i know what that looks like i moved the decimal 10 places 12 places i mean Right, so even scientific notations to try and get around our, well, our firmware limitations, our brains just don't think that well when it comes to numbers. All right, um, generally, we can write each of these prefixes. Anytime we're gonna write a new conversion factor with these prefixes, there's two ways we can write it. So we can write that there's a thousand meters equals one kilometer. What's the other way we could write that? One meter is 0 0.001 kilometers. <laughs> Which of those works better with your brain, generally speaking? I like thinking in whole numbers, not in decimals or fractions. I like to deal with 10, with 10 to a positive integer rather than 10 to a negative integer. But mathematically, this one's just as correct. This one's just easier to remember. What about the other way? Yeah, or when I say the other way, um, what about milli? What's the conversion, the two conversions for millimeters and meters? You gotta put a one on one side here and a number on the other side. Milli means what? Thousand, but the opposite direction is kilo, right? So 1,000 meet millimeters is one meter. Or one millimeter equals One millimeter is 0 0.001 meters, 10 to the minus three meters. Again, either one is perfectly fine to use mathematically. Pick the one that makes the most sense to you, which for most people is gonna be this one, right? And then get used to how you use that equation sheet to look this stuff up. Right, so go to the equation sheet, look at it and say, okay, milli, it says 10 to the minus three. What does that mean? It means that a thousand of the millimeter is one of the big unit, of the base unit. Kilos 10 to the positive three is the multiplier. So in other words, a thousand of the base unit is one of the new unit. Just work with it, practice with the ones that you know, the prefixes that you already know how to do this so that you can get this right and you won't mess things up. Everybody knows that um, that rule of thumb when it comes to practicing anything, any skill, but especially when you're studying, you don't practice till you get it right. You practice till what? Till you can't get it wrong. You don't just stop the first time you do something right in the sport and think, man, I've mastered that, do you? No, you practice it until you're doing it in your sleep sometimes literally, right? Then you've mastered. That works with the writing out your conversions too. As boring as it sounds, 
I want you thinking in terms of conversions. I want you to be visualizing conversions and metric prefixes when you fall asleep at night. It was perhaps not the most um, healthy um, environment, but it, my uh, grad school advisor used to say, if you're not dreaming about chemistry, then you're not working hard enough. You're not quite there yet, but same thing applies. If you're having weird chemistry dreams at night, it probably means you're working really hard and you're doing a good job. It's not a red flag, that's a positive sign. At least for your chemistry teacher it is. All right. Uh, we've already done some of these. 10 to the minus three grams is, how, is what unit? It's 10 to the minus three is a thousand, right? So what is one thousandth of a gram? Milligram. And 0 0.01 meters is what? One. 0 0.01, so just 10 to the minus two, so centimeters. Right. Other than centi, there are some some other um, ones in here. But other than centi and deci, everything else goes powers of ten to the three, ten to the three, ten to the six, ten to the nine, ten to the twelve. Um, so basically, every thousand of something. So. A thousand meters is a kilometer, a thousand kilometers is a megameter, a thousand megameters is a gigameter, a thousand gigameters is a terameter. Right? So get used to thinking in those um, powers of 10 to the 3. And we pretty much never use deci. It's on here because you may see it at some point. There is, and then there's deca, is 10 to the positive 10. So there is a decameter is 10 meters, but there hardly anybody uses those. So not really gonna spend much time with those. Plus it's really confusing keeping track of deci versus deca. They look really, really similar. Um, I guess actually one more thing about this, you might notice some of these prefixes are the same letter. How do you tell the difference between a millimeter and a megameter? Capitalization. This is the first time we're going to start getting picky about capitalization. It doesn't matter in terms of I don't know, your username or writing things down in everyday life. Um, it does matter when we're talking about units. A megameter is not the same as a millimeter. And if I write this, that's actually millimolar millimoles per liter, which is a unit of chemistry unit we'll get into. You guys remember moles, right? Moles per liter is capital M is the unit. So lowercase m followed by a capital M is millimoles per liter. So, and then in theory, I've never actually seen this, but in theory, you could have megamoles per liter if you wrote it like this. So the fact that these four mean four very different things means you need to be careful with your capitalization. And when you're showing your work, you need to write it clearly enough so that somebody who's not an expert in your personal handwriting will still be able to tell if it's a capital or not. The one that gets people sometimes is sometimes people will write their capital N's just like a big lowercase n. That, please don't you're gonna get marked down points because I don't know if you meant that to be a capital N or not, All right? So we're gonna to try to be unambiguous with our capitals as much as we can. That also starts coming, playing a role when it comes to um, our peri periodic table as well. So we'll get more practice with that. But just a reminder to pay attention to that. Um, this is, that's also why you can't trust Google to do your conversions for you. If you say, if you write how many, you know, 2.5 megameters into miles, Google doesn't under search engines in general don't understand how to parse capitalization. And so it'll try to turn it from millimeters into miles. 
don't let Google do your thinking for you because they get it wrong nine times out of 10 when we're talking about scientific things, right? Write out your own conversion. Use Google as a calculator, just don't let it think. All right. Got a little bit more time. So there's some practice converting here. Um, let's, let's look at this bottom right one. 600 inches cubed into gallons. What does a cubic inch look like? What is a cubic inch? Is it a unit of length? Volume, right? It's not an area, that'd be a square inch. A cubic inch is volume. A cubic, one cubic inch is a cube where all three dimensions are one inch. One inch by one inch by one inch. So is there anything tricky about converting 600 cubic inches into gallons, into another volume. Not if you have your conversion sheet, right? Or I give you a conversion. Just means, okay, well, we have a conversion that says, or we have an equality that says for every 231 cubic inches, that's one gallon. And that is a conversion within the same system, right? Inches is imperial and so is gallons. So that's exact. It's a weird number. I don't know why they picked 231 cubic inches, but they did. That is the definition of a gallon now. So it's inches to the third, but our conversion has inches to the third. So it just cancels out like normal, right? Just like X cubed divided by X cubed would cancel out. So we just get 600 divided by 231 gives us gallons. It's going to be what? 2.1? 2. 2. what? Oh, six. I carried that wrong. How many sig figs do we get to keep? This is exact, which means infinite sig figs. So we had four sig figs here. We get to keep four sig figs. So 2.8. Oh, so 5.9597. Good. What if we wanted to convert 600 cubic inches into cubic centimeters? How would we do that? Six hundred inches cubed, and we can say one inch is two point five four centimeters. Is that going to cancel out inches? Kind of, a third of the way. This is inches times inches times inches, right? Doing it like this, we cancel out one inch. We didn't cancel out all three of them though. Put it this way, if we wanted to take the same cube and we wanted to put it and find out what the volume is in centimeters cubed, we could convert each side here, right? We could take the same and say, okay, multiply this one by 2.54 to get 2.54 centimeters. 2.54, 2.54. So what's the volume in cubic centimeters of this one, one cubic inch? 2.54 cubed. We have to convert all three dimensions into centimeters, right? We have to do it three times, which is another way of saying we have inches cubed. We want to cancel it out. We need inches on the bottom three times as well.
which means we're going to use the same conversion three times in a row or put a cube there. How, how does distribution work if you've got a, an exponent outside of um, parentheses? You cube everything in there, right? So if we distributed this, it would be 2.54 cubed, centimeters cubed, one cubed, inches cubed. Now we've got something that'll cancel out, right? All three powers of cubic inches cancel out. As long as our conversion has a one on one side, it's that's not really gonna change anything, right? One cubed is one. What do we get for an answer? I've shifted the decimal place on accident. Let's we'll still be looking at 600 cubic inches, not six. What's seven what? 73. No, I think you did. I just. I called an audible and I just moved the decimal place back over to make it 600 again. So if it's 600, it should, I should just be able to shift the decimal two points from what you said. Oh, that doesn't quite seem right though. One more digit. That sounds more, because what's two, I don't know what 2.54 cubed is, but I know it's gonna be between eight and 27, right? 16. How do I know it's between 8 and 27 mentally? What's 2 cubed? What's 3 cubed? 27. So I don't know what 2.54 is cubed, but I know it's between 8 and 27, which means I shouldn't be getting 780 something for my answer here because it's going to be something that's multiplying by 10 at least. So that's what I call a reasonableness check. Is my answer reasonable based on what I had to plug in? If I know I've got to take 600 and multiply by something that's going to be a little bit more than 10, I better get something that's in the thousands out of it. All right, so the, this is what, what I generally refer to as, as uh, converting higher powers of units. It's the same conversion, we're just doing it more than once. Works for areas too. So if we wanna do, let's do another example. Let's say the city of South Lake Tahoe is I'm just going to make up a number is 25 square miles. How many acres is that? 25 miles squared. I think on one of the next few slides I have. No, oh, must be on next. That's 4,300 and no, 43,000. Let's look up what that conversion is. I'm not even sure it's on our conversion sheet, but I'm using acres. Four thousand forty three thousand five hundred and sixty square feet. That was close. So if we want to take square miles to acres, 
How are we going to do that? Well, we know we're going to have to use, this is our only conversion that has an acre in it, right? This is all we know about an acre is it has this number. So if we're going to get to acres, we've got to get to square feet. So 25 miles squared, what's a conversion that's going to get us from miles, square miles to square feet? One mile equals 5,280 feet, except that that's just one side of the square, right? We got to do both sides of the square. And then we're going to have square feet on top. So four, three, five, six, zero square feet on bottom. Do I need to square that one too? Why not? It's already squared, right? If I squared this conversion, I'd get square acres per four foot to the fourth. I don't know what a four dimensional foot looks like. Um, it doesn't make any sense, right? You shouldn't have a four dimensional foot. So we shouldn't square this conversion. It's already got square feet as part of the conversion itself. So how many acres is South Lake Tahoe? How much? 16,000. How many sig figs do we get to keep? Just the two. This is still an exact conversion. If you carry all the digits when you square 5,280, this conversion is exact. So when you square it, it's still exact. And same here. This is an exact conversion. So. say 1.6 times 10 to the fourth acres. So an acre really isn't that big in terms of square miles, right? Which is why when they're when you hear um, you know read news articles where they're talking about the size of wildfires, they're in hundreds of thousands of acres and then they'll be like, which is you know 70 square miles because there's a lot of acres in a square mile. All right. Perfect timing. Have a good day, everybody. See you on Wednesday.